Okay, inshallah, we'll begin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So as you know, um, Wednesdays is usually our tafsir class. So we've been covering the tafsir of Surah Al Imran. Uh, today though, we're going to do something slightly different, inshallah. We're going to take a break away from tafsir to discuss um, an important topic. And it's a topic that I've been thinking about for a long time. And it's a topic that I think deserves a lot of attention. It's a topic that I think many people do not understand very well. And those that do have an understanding of it have a somewhat superficial level of understanding of that particular topic. I recently gave a few khutbahs on it. I, I think I gave a khutbah on it here last month or the month before. But it deserves more than a khutbah. It deserves an actual fara, dars or lesson where we can delve deeper than we can in a, compared to a khutbah maybe. What is this topic? This is a topic relating to suhbah, companionship, and al-hubbu fillah wa al-hubbu lillah. Companionship and loving for the sake of Allah, which has two types, hub fillah and hub lillah. And we will break down the difference between the two later. Why is this an important topic? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being as a sociable creature. The word in fact insan is related to the word uns, anis. Uns is serenity, is a type of feeling that you get, a special type of serenity and peace of mind that you get when you are in the company of someone. Hence, an anis, an anis is a, a close companion, a close friend. This is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created human beings. This is the default status of, of man. We, we need to be in the company of, of other people. And in our religion though, this is something that isn't left to itself to sort of go in any direction. Our religion gives us teachings and guidelines how to engage with other people, how to view our relationships with other people as well. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an, he said that there is no greater blessing after the blessing of Islam, min akhin salih, then a righteous brother. Ma u'atiya al-abdu ba'd al-islami ni'mah khayran min akhin salih. He said a, a, a servant hasn't been given anything better after the blessing of Islam than a righteous brother, meaning a righteous companion. Fa'idha wajada ahadukum muddan min akhihi and so when one of you find that you have this wood, this type of love and affection for his brother, then let him hold on to that. Let him hold on to that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also commands the believers to be with other righteous people. Be with those who are truthful. وَاسْقِدْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِي يُرِيدُونَ وَجَهَا Allah says, patiently stick with those who call upon their Lord in the mornings and in the evenings, seeking His pleasure. وَلَا تَعْدُ عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ تُرِيدُ زِينَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا And don't let your eyes look beyond them, those who are desiring the luxuries of the world. Meaning, stick with those people, have sabr with those people who call upon their Lord morning and evening. So clearly in our religion, 
there is a great emphasis. Allah also says, Al Akhilla Uyoma Ibn Baduhum Libadin Aduun illa Muttaqin. That close friends will be enemies to one another on the on the day of judgment. Close friends will be enemies to one another on the day of judgment, except the righteous. Illa Muttaqin. So that shows that there will be many people that will have close relationships and close friendships in the dunya, but he won't benefit them unless their friendship was based upon taqwa. Their friendship was based upon consciousness and awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I haven't really maybe uh, given you a, a, a good idea as to why I think this is a um, an important topic and why I think people understand it in a very shallow and superficial way. Often when you find that many people they talk about brotherhood or companionship or loving someone for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala oftentimes we don't really understand what it actually means. For example the expression when you say to someone I love you for the sake of Allah Why do we say that? What pushes a person to say that? Is it because they like that person? Is it because they find a type of attraction to that person? Like, mashallah, he's got a really good, you know, his characteristics are really good. I get along with him well. Well, I really like him, for example. You know, we get along, he makes me laugh. Mashallah, he's a good person. And so you say, I love you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Often the times we find that we use that expression, Uhibbuka fillah, I love you for the sake of Allah, simply because you get along with that person. And that person has some sort of religious identity. But beyond that, we don't know what else that phrase actually means. We haven't thought about it enough. And that's why many scholars, I remember a shaykh, one of his students said to him, Uhibbuka fillah. And he said to him, Don't say that to me unless you really mean it. Unless you understand what it means. So what does it mean? This is the, this is the issue. And what I found is that actually if you delve deep into this concept of loving someone for the sake of Allah, you find that often people don't actually truly understand what it actually means. They don't. They have a very basic, superficial understanding of it as well. And likewise, companionship. Choosing friends. Is it really based for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or is it based upon a natural type of friendship that everyone develops and everyone seeks to have in life? And I'll be honest, speaking on a personal level, I don't think I've met anyone in my life that has truly approached the concept of Muslim Brotherhood and loving someone for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in its deepest possible meaning. Yes, there are many people that have friendships, quote unquote, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it's very shallow. And often it's actually to cover something else. Often, for example, many people, they're by nature, as we mentioned, human beings are people who are very sociable by nature. And so it's a fitri need. It's a natural need for every human being to have friends and to have companions. It's very natural. Everyone wants that. Everyone likes to have good companionship. But they sort of cover it and sugarcoat it with... Islamic terminology, okay, whereas in reality, it's just a basic level of friendship that everyone has, even non-Muslims will have. So what I hope to uncover, inshallah, in this um, gathering, in this majlis, is for us to develop a better understanding of Islamic companionship, and what it truly means to love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Perhaps, inshallah, we can then go and look to form a friendship or a companionship
purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, a number of scholars have spoken about this in detail. You can refer to the books like of Ibn Qudama in his Muhtasar Minhaj al Qasidin or Imam al Ghazali in his Ihya Ulum al Din. And many other scholars, they've expounded on these topics in great detail. So, let us begin by speaking about um, or mentioning maybe some of the important sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and some of the companions and maybe some of the Salaf of this Ummah and how they viewed just the importance of, of companionship. And then we will move on from there. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, لا تصاحب إلا مؤمنا ولا يأكل طعامك إلا تقي Do not accompany except a believer. لا تصاحب إلا مؤمنا Do not accompany except a believer. Meaning, choose if you choose someone as a sahib, as a as a companion, choose a mu'min, choose a believer, someone who believes in Allah has a quality of iman. ولا يأكل طعامك إلا تقيون and no one should eat your food except a God-fearing person now that's a very interesting thing to say no one should eat your food except a God-fearing man now who do you invite into your home to eat your food close friends isn't it you're not going to usually invite a stranger or invite someone you don't like you'll invite someone who is close to you your ashab your friends so, وَلَا يَأْكُلْ طَعَامَكَ إِلَّا تَقِيٌّ Meaning, let it be the case that your close friends are people who have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu also said, الْمَرْءُ عَلَى دِينِ خَلِيلِهِ A person is upon the religion of their khalil, of their close friend. A person will be on the religion of their close friend. فَلْيَنْظُرْ أَحَدُكُمْ مَنْ يُخَالِلْ So let a person look to who he takes as a close friend. Meaning, be careful. Because the person that you choose to accompany, you will end up being influenced by his environment, you'll be influenced by his behavior, you'll be influenced by his ideas. المرء على دين خليله. So these are just some of the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ that relate to the importance of companionship and suhba. Likewise, the companions, even the Prophet, look at the, the statement of Abu Darda, رضي الله عنه. He said, لولا ثلاث ما أحببت البقاء ساعة. If it wasn't for free things. In life, I wouldn't wish to live here in the dunya. Dama al hawajir, yani al siyamu fi nahar, the fast during the hot day, in reference to fasting. So fasting during hot days, was sujudu fi layl, making you know praying at night time, and the third thing he said was very interesting. وَمُجَالَسَةُ أَقْوَامٍ يَنْتَقُونَ جَيِّدَ الْكَلَامِ كَمَا يُنْتَقَى أَطَائِبُ الثَّمَرِ And accompanying people, sitting with people who choose their speech like the way people will pick good dates. So imagine you have like, you know, you want to take some dates, you have a bunch of dates. You're not just going to take any, you look specifically for the good ones to eat and to take. So he said, this is one of the free things in life. If it wasn't for the, these free things, he wouldn't love to live in the dunya. Meaning this is what it meant for a companion. Okay, to a companion, this was the, the, one of the most beloved things to him in the dunya. To sit with people and not just, and, and this shows you the understanding of the companions as well. The mujalasa, the sitting with, you know, people. For what reason? To have a laugh? To enjoy himself. This is often how we conceal brotherhood nowadays in our religion. 
Okay, your akhi, your akh, your close brother that you say you love for the sake of Allah, when you sit down with him, what do you talk about? Often, because as I mentioned before, our friendships are often based on a natural type of affinity that, that we will speak about later. As the Prophet referred to, Al Arwahu Junudun Mujannada, that the souls are like, they are like assembled armies, ranks of armies. Ma ta'arafa minha italaf. Whatever they know of one another, they come close to one another. Okay, I mean, people, they, they find this close affinity with someone, they have the same interests, the same likes, they have a nice time together. All right. And often you find the majalis of brothers that love each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's not much khayr in them. There's not much goodness in them. Backbiting, just laughing around, joking around, playing games. Okay? And beyond that, there's not much meaning to it. And even Allah establishes, لا خير في كثير من نجواه. It's not much good in many of the private gatherings many people have. So when we say this is our friendship for the sake of Allah subhanahu we're doing it for the sake of Allah, we have to be very careful. Very, very careful. And not fool ourselves. Here Abu Darda, he said, what was the mujalasa for? The mujalasa to aqwamin yantaquna jayyid al-kalam. That they, he would look to sit with people who would pick their words to make sure that they would say the best possible thing. So the gathering will be just full of insightful discussions and that would bring them truly closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are many statements like this of, of other people. Imam al-Shafi'i لَوْلَ الْقِيَامُ بِالْأَسْحَارِ وَصُحْبَةُ الْأَخْيَارِ مَخْتَرْتُ الْبَقَاءَ فِي هَذِهِ الدَّارِ If it wasn't for praying at night time and having good companions, then I wouldn't have chosen to remain upon this earth. So, you know, we can mention statements after statements with regards to the early generation and how they held companionship to be such a precious thing in their lives. And the reality is that's not just for companions, it's for everyone. Everyone wants to have good companionship and good friendship. But the reality is what is pushing us towards that. Now, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam though, whilst establishing that we are in need of companionship and that we need to choose good companions, he also established that good companions are difficult to come, across, to, to come by. Righteous companions are difficult to come by. In a well-known hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, النَّاسُ كَالْإِبْلِ الْمِئَةِ لَا تَجِدُ فِيهَا رَاحِلَةِ That people are like 100 camels. People are like 100 camels. You could barely find the right camel to ride. What does this mean? Meaning, out of 100 camels, if you were to look, if you had a, like a herd of 100 camels, you will only find maybe one or two that is good enough to ride on, that can take on your burden, that can take on your belongings. Otherwise, most of the camels are of no benefit. Okay, they, they won't be tamed. They won't be, you know, some of them will be weak. Some of them, you know, will be very stubborn. You know, with camels, they can be very stubborn. They'll spit in your face and, you know, yeah. So you will just about maybe find one or two. And that's the reality with regards to human beings. So this is why Sa'di rahimahullah, when he explained this hadith, you know, he said, وَهَكَذَا النَّاسِ This is just like with human beings as well. فَإِذَا أَرَدْتَ أَن تَنْتَخِبَ مِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَصْلُحُ لِلتَّعْلِيمِ أَوِ الْفَتْوَى أَوِ الْإِمَامَ أَوِ الْوِلَايَاتِ الْكِبَارِ أَوِ الصِّغَارِ أَوْ لِلْوَضَائِفِ الْمُهِمَّةِ لَمْ تَكَدْ تَجِدْ مَنْ يَقُومَ بِتِلْكَ الْوَضِيفَ قِيَامًا صَالِحًا so he said, if you were to look for someone to um, good enough to teach people or good enough for fatwa or good enough to lead people in salah or to be in a position of leadership, big or small, or any other position, you would barely find anyone suitable enough to, to carry out that task. So, you know, هذا هو الواقع. This is the, you know, the reality of, of human beings. This is the reality of human beings. So whilst we are meant to be sociable creatures, 
we often find it's very hard to form a meaningful friendship with somebody that is truly positive and good for your for your deen now <clears throat> if we look to the hadith that speak about loving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we find we find something truly amazing we find something truly amazing the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for example we know in the famous hadith about the seven people who will be shaded under the shade of Allah on, on a day in which there is no shade except his shade. Out of those seven people, he mentioned the two people who loved each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They met each other for the sake of Allah and they left their gathering for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani the beginning and the end of the gathering was purely for the sake of Allah. And we, again, we will need to speak about this meaning. What does it mean for the sake of Allah? But they will have a great reward. They will have the shade of Allah. But this hadith, the next hadith I, I will mention, I want you to think about it. The Prophet ﷺ said, Inna min ibadillah la unasan. That from amongst mankind, there will be a group of people. Ma hum bi anbiya wa la shuhada yaghbituhum al anbiya wa shuhada that they are not prophets, they're not martyrs, but the prophets and martyrs will be jealous of them in a good way on the Day of Judgment. Why? ta'ala. Due to their status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Sahaba they said, who are these people? Akhbirna, tukhbiruna man hum ya Rasulullah. Will you tell us who these people are? So imagine, there's a group of people, just think about it. There's a group of people that the prophets and the martyrs will be jealous of. Another narration actually mentions they will be ala manabirin min nur. They will be on pulpits made of light, meaning they will stand very tall. People will see them. They will stand out from amongst, the, amongst, the, 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 amongst mankind. The Prophet ﷺ said, Hum qawmun tahabu bi rawhillah. They are people who loved each other for the spirit of Allah, meaning for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ala ghayri arhamin baynahum. It wasn't due to the fact that they have close ties with them. Rahim, like their relatives, that's why they like them. Not due to any amwal, it's not due to any money that's owed to one of them or financial reasons. For wallahi inna wujuhahum la nur. By Allah, their faces are faces of light. Wa innahum ala nur. They will be upon light. وَلَا يَخَافُونَ إِذَا خَافَ الْنَاسِ And they will, be not, they, they will not be in a state of any fear when the other people are in a state of fear. وَلَا يَحْزَنُونَ إِذَا حَزِنَ الْنَاسِ They will not be sad when the other people will be sad. And then he recited the ayah. أَلَا إِنَّ أَوْلِيَاءَ اللَّهِ لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Indeed, the awliya of Allah, they are a group of people, there will be no fear on them on that day, nor will they be sad. Think about this, brothers and sisters. Why do they have so much ajr when loving someone for the sake of Allah seems to be such a simple issue? Now we have to understand in our religion, reward for actions usually correlates with the amount of effort you put in, isn't it? The greater the effort, the greater the reward. <coughs> As the Prophet said to Aisha radiallahu anha, Inna ajraki ala qadari nasabiki. Your reward is in accordance with your nasab, the hard effort and you put in. So this hadith indicates a great reward. Huge reward that the anbiya and the shuhada, they will be jealous of these people. Why? Because they loved each other for the sake of Allah. What does that mean, therefore, about loving each other for the sake of Allah? Is it an easy thing? No, it's hard. You have to work for it. It's something which is meaningful. It is something which is deep and profound. It's not something that we say very easily with our tongues. Uhibbuka fillah. I love you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. It is something very deep, very profound, something that requires you to have a heart that is nurtured upon loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Because if your heart doesn't, is, is far away from loving Allah or isn't deeply connected with the love of Allah, then this statement is, is pointless, is meaningless. I love you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you will see, and we will see why. So let us discuss this point now. What does it mean to love for the, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to form a companionship? The first point is that if you look to the different relationships we have in life, they are of two types. The first is the type of relationships we tend to form naturally over time. Your neighbor, for example, okay, you get to know them. It's a very sort of, assuming you have a good neighbor. <laughs> you have a good neighbor, you get to know them well, you get along well. Okay, you form, you know, you, you speak to each other now and again, exchange smiles and things like that. Okay, it's quite natural. Uh, the people you meet at work, the people you study with, the people you meet in the masjid, right? And you form a good relationship. And you get to know one another as a result. These types of relationships that people form, okay, often in most cases, doesn't fall under the label of loving someone for the sake of Allah. Often, because they're just natural. What the scholars say, ittifaqi, as opposed to being ikhtiyari. Ittifaqi means it just happens. You haven't made a conscious choice. Because we are rewarded, this is an important point, okay, that I want you to walk away with. We are rewarded for making conscious decisions. We are not rewarded for natural things that we like. Okay, loving someone for the sake of Allah isn't just a natural attraction. It's a choice that you make that you will be rewarded for. Okay, it's a natural, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a re, it's a reward based on choice that you make. And that's why these scholars, they said that the, the concept of al-hubbu lillah wa fillah is based upon ikhtiyar. It's based upon your choice. And this is where the reward, it actually lies which then leads us on to the next point so if we say your reward that these hadith speak about loving someone for the sake of Allah is based upon choice then we find that we end up loving someone based on one of two reasons either we love them for their that for who they are. We love them for their qualities that they possess. For example, if you see um, someone's character is very good character, or for example, it could be your spouse. Okay, you love their physical appearance, their beauty, for example. These are things which we are naturally inclined towards. Okay, we are inclined towards character that you like. Okay, and again, so this is really, if you, can th if you look at it from this perspective, it's not really a matter of choice. It's actually something which is quite natural. Okay, and so this is uh, when the Prophet ﷺ said in the famous hadith, Al-Arwahu Junudun Mujannada, Souls are like ranked uh, soldiers. فَمَا تَعَارَفَ مِنْهَا اِتَّلَفْ So whatever, and, and this is in reference to before we came to this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created our arwah. So our souls were created before we came into the dunya. And these souls came to know one another. So the souls that came to know one another it was due to the, the, some sort of commonality between them. Telaf. And that's why you'll find such people, they end up liking one another in the dunya because they get along. They have common interests. They have common qualities. And that's why they say there was a, a woman who was from Mecca. This was the time of the Sahaba. 
she was what you can describe as a comedian. She used to make people laugh. And she was from Mecca. And she went to Medina. And when she went to Medina, she came across another woman who had the same qualities like her. Meaning there was a woman who was known. I mean, we all know people like this, right? We have friends and companions that they're known as the jokers, right? They make people laugh. And so this woman met this other woman. It's like by chance, somehow they got to know each other and they, were, they became quite close. When Aisha radiallahu anha, she saw that, she said, Subhanallah, Sadaqa Rasulullah sallallahu How true, the Messenger sallallahu he said, Al-arwahu junudun mujannada. These souls, yeah, they are like these ranked soldiers that whatever they, uh, when they know one another, they become close to one another. Right? Meaning when they have the same qualities, that's when they have this i'tilaf, they come together. This is something which is very natural, right? This is something which is uh, very natural and something that people do. Again, this type of companionship and friendship, this is not where the reward lies, right? This is not where the reward, this great reward that the prophets and the shuhada will be jealous of on the day of judgment. Natural friendship that people find. No. Okay, it's just that, that those types of things are natural affiliations. Sometimes the affiliation that you have with other people is based on good reasons. In a hadith it mentions, as reported in al bayhaqi in Shu'ab al-Iman, it says that if a believer was to go to a gathering of a hundred munafiqeen, but there was one believer amongst them, that this believer will eventually end up sitting next to the mu'min, to the believer. Why? Because he shares similar qualities. Likewise, if a munafiq, right, went to a gathering where there were a hundred believers, mu'minin, but one of them was a munafiq, he will eventually end up with that munafiq. Itilaf, right? There's that commonality between them. The reward doesn't lie there. Brothers and sisters, that's not where the reward it lies. This great reward. There's a saying that Kullu insanin ya'nasu ila shaklihi. Right? Every human being tends to find uns, find that sort of peace and serenity with uh, the one that is like him. Right? With the one, with the person that is like him. And uh, it was mentioned that it was, uh, I can't remember the name of the companion, but they said, uh, he said that uh, whenever you find people get along very well, it's usually due to a good quality. Or sorry, when, whenever you find that people get along in the dunya, it's usually used to a common quality they have between them. So one day he saw a, a pigeon with a crow. Right? And people said, how strange. These are two different birds, right? But yet they're together. And, and he was found that quite shocking as well because he, he was the one who would tell people, people, you know, even we have this expression in English, isn't it? What's the expression in English? Um, is it birds of a feather flock together? Yeah. So yeah, the, the, yeah so the birds of a feather flock together. Or along those lines, yeah? And so he looked at that and he said, this is strange. Now we have a hammama and we have a, a ghurab. We have like this crow and we have a, 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 a pigeon. But when they both flew off, he saw that they were one-legged. And he said, ah, see, this was the thing that made them come together. Yeah, this was the thing that made them come together. So whenever you have that friendship with somebody, it would be due to there being some commonality between you and that person. Once that commonality goes, the friendship goes. Yeah, and this is an important point. Once that commonality goes, the friendship it goes. That's why you find many people, they often complain and they say, when they grow up, and this is maybe for the people that are like in their 30s and their 40s, okay? You go through stages in life where you move on from types of friendships. Sometimes you find in life, 
you move away from certain circles of friend. Why is that the case? It's because your common interests are no longer the same. But then what happens is people lament and they say, oh, what happened to ukhuwa fillah? What happened to brotherhood for the sake of Allah? Are they still believers? Well, this is the point. That friendship was never based on for the sake of Allah. It was based on other commonalities. So, the true area where we find uh, where love, loving someone for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's where you'll get the reward okay how is that the case how does that come about the scholars they say that people form friendships when it's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a means it's a means it's a tawassul it's a means to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when you see someone as a means to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is when it becomes hub fillah remember this hub fillah Fi, remember the word fi, love for the sake of Allah, fillah. When you view that person as a means to draw closer to Allah. So for example, your shaykh or your teacher, you love them for the sake of Allah. Why? You see that this person is a means by which you will enter in, inshallah into paradise. Why? Because that shaykh will teach you something that will take you to closer to paradise. How can you not love that person? You see that person and you say, this person is teaching me how to pray, how to remember Allah, how to stay away from haram, how to rise higher in paradise. So you see that person as a wasila, as a means to take you to paradise. This is why you love that individual. For that reason, this is hub fillah. And that's why uh, uh, the scholars that define what's the sign that it is hub filla. They said, Hadduhu, it's like definition, and to, to know that whether this is truly for the sake of Allah. They said, Kullu hubbin, lawla al imanu billahi wal yawm al akhir, lam yutasawar wujuduhu, fahu hubbun filla. So, Kullu hubbin. لَوْلَا الْإِيمَانُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ لَمْ يُتَصَوَّرْ وُجُودُهُ So imagine that there is a love. Okay? لَوْلَا الْإِيمَانُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ Meaning, if you have a relationship or a love for someone, if it wasn't for the fact that, th that there was Iman in Allah on the Day of Judgment, then that relationship wouldn't exist. This is a sign that it is for the sake of Allah. Again, let me explain this. So, kullu hubbin lawla al-imanu billah. So, if it was for the sake of Allah, fillah, right? If it truly was for the sake of Allah, then that would mean if belief in Allah and belief in the Day of Judgment was taken out of those individuals, they will have no friendship. They will have no attachment to one another. Because the thing that bonded them together was what? The hub for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning they viewed their relationship as a means to, uh, uh, to, to, enter, to attain Allah's reward. For example, your shaykh. If for example your shaykh, billah, one day left the fold of Islam. Would you love that shaykh for the sake of Allah? You wouldn't love that shaykh. Yeah, because the only reason why you loved him was because he brought you closer to Allah. Um, so therefore, what about that believer? That one believer? He's still a believer, right? But he doesn't bring you closer to Allah. In fact, he distracts you. He makes you lazy. He wastes your time. He makes you fall into sin. He doesn't do anything to bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet you claim you love him for the sake of Allah? 
What's that? That's merely playing with our words. So the true sign is that if the Iman was to be taken away or your love for Allah was to be taken away, that friendship will no longer exist. So this is Hub Fillah. Now what is Hub Lillah? With a lamb now. Hub Lillah. Now, Al Mahbub, Al Muhib. If you truly love someone to a very strong degree, you will love whatever that person loves. Yeah? Let me repeat that. If you truly love someone, you will love whatever that person loves. We see this, for example, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He truly loved Khadija radiallahu anha to the extent that even after she died, he still cared for the people that Khadija cared for in her life. So he would, whenever he would receive food, he would distribute it to the friends and relatives of Khadija radiallahu anha. Because his hub for Khadija was genuine. Likewise, the believer who truly loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and realizes that, for example, when he sees qualities in a person that he believes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, then he will love him as a result of that. So if you see someone, for example, who dedicates their life to the Qur'an, who masters its qira'at and who's someone who acts upon the Qur'an, then you love that person because you think, subhanallah, this person, inshallah, we, we can't confirm that a person is beloved to Allah or not. But you see that this person has qualities that Allah loves. Naturally, you find that you want to love that person for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so it, it's not just a natural affiliation and a, a affinity, but it also affects your behavior towards that person. So you will love that person, you will show them affection as a result of the fact that you believe that this person is loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you will show love with your actions towards that individual. And we know the famous lines of Majnoon and Layla, okay, where Majnoon he said, Amurru ala diyari, diyari Layla, uqabbilu dhal jidara wa dhal jidar, wa ma hubbu diyari shagafna qalbi, walakin hubbu man sakana diyara. So in the story of Majnoon and Layla, Majnoon he goes to the walls of the old home where Layla used to live. It's, you know, the home is no longer inhabited. Okay, and so he goes, Amurru ala diyari Layla. I go past her own hold where she used to live. Uqabbilu dhal jidari wa dhal jidar. I kiss this wall and I kiss that wall. وَمَا حُبُّ الدِّيَارِ شَغَفْنَ قَلْبِي But it's not due to my love for these walls. I don't love the walls itself. وَلَكِنْ حُبُّ مَنْ سَكَنَ الدِّيَارِ But it's due to the love that I have for the one who inhabited these walls. Who lived in these walls. Meaning who? Layla. So this is an expression to illustrate what it means to love Lilla. When you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much, you end up loving whatever Allah loves and so this affects the way you behave with that person. Based upon choice. Based upon choice. So the ikram that you show to someone from you believe to be from Ahlul Quran, you consciously honor that person because that is for the sake of Allah. That is what you are rewarded for. That is what a person is rewarded for. So this shows you that 
al hubbu there so, so the, the, the re, what we are rewarded for is when you make that conscious decision and that hub is either filla or it is lilla it, it becomes filla when it's used as a means to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or when you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much you see qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves in an individual and so you love that person consciously and you say this is a person who has qualities that Allah loves and so I, I choose to love this individual and I choose to love this person these two qualities if a person has then they can say that they love that individual fillah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but this is very difficult this is very difficult wallahi is very difficult to find someone genuinely and you love them either fillah or lilla okay number one it's hard because the prophet sallam told us and nasuk al ibl al mi'a people are like a hundred camels you can barely find you know the right person to uh, to accompany or to choose as a companion etc and so this reason we find many of the scholars would actually and many of the salihin and the righteous that came before us they would often prefer solitude over companionship with people because they said most people okay they're harmful <laughs> right the prophet sallam was once asked ayyun nasi afdal who amongst mankind are the best he said, Rajun Yujahidu fi sabilillahi bi mali wa bi nafsi. A man who strives in the way of Allah with his life and with his wealth. And then he was said, Thumma man, then who? And he said, Mu'minun fi shi'bin min al shi'abi ya'budullaha rabbahu wa yada'un nasa min sharrihi. And the second person is a believer who worships Allah on top of a mountainside. He worships Allah, his Lord, and he abandons people, okay, not due to their evil, but due to his own evil. Meaning he's so conscious and worried that he doesn't want his bad characteristics and, and behavior to influence somebody else. So he preferred to stay by himself. Now, there is discussion amongst the scholars does this hadith apply to all times or is it akhir zaman? Does it refer to towards the end of times? Which, you know, many scholars do say that is the case. But it's still a discussion that many scholars have. Uh, a, a, an old age discussion. What is considered to be better for people? What's the default position? Uzla or ikhtilat? Is seclusion the best thing for righteous people or is to be mixing with other people? And there are evidences for both. You know, the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, The believer who mixes with people and he's patient upon dealing with their harms, he is better than the believer who doesn't mix with people and is not patient upon dealing with their harms. So this hadith seems to indicate that it's better, more virtuous to engage with other people. But then you have other hadith, like the hadith that I just mentioned, that speak about one of the, the, the best groups of people are people who tend to seclude themselves. So there's, there's goodness in both. And sometimes it's relative. It depends on your circumstances. Depends on the situation. Depends on the environment around you. There are many things you have to factor in. But he وسلم, was also asked, Ya Nabi Allah, man naja? He was once asked, what is salvation? How do I attain najah? The Prophet ﷺ said, Amlik alayka lisanak. Hold on to this tongue of yours. Hold on to it. Waliyasa'aka baytuk. And let your home be spacious enough for you. Meaning, so that you don't have to go out of your home unnecessarily. Meaning, you can fulfill all of your duties and responsibilities if you're at home. Whereas if you're outside, for example, you'll be mixing with people, you'll be spreading haram, you'll be, in, you'll be influenced by haram and, and what have you. And the third thing he said, well, tabki ala khatiyatik, and cry over your sins. And cry over your sins. So there are, I mean, this is a longer discussion. We can have a whole entire session dedicated to this discussion of uzla and suhba and ikhtilat or isolating oneself or 
being mixing with other people, how do we manage ourselves as believers? But the only reason why I mention this is to show you that righteous companionship is hard to come by. And this is why we have statements of the companions and the early generation that indicate that they clinged on to anyone that they thought was a sahib of khayr, was a companion of goodness. Someone who would bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as I said, and I keep on repeating this, but that is hard to find. It is hard to find people that are like that. So what do you do when there aren't people like that? You, you take your guard, you protect yourselves and you protect others from your own self as well. And so therefore, brothers and sisters, and I'm saying this, you know, not as someone, I'm not someone who's very old, but I'm not someone who's very young. <laughs> okay? Those who are older than me will know, for example, you will go through different stages in your life where people will come and go. Friendships will come and go. And when you're very young and you're starting to practice your deen, okay, you will form many friendships. Okay, but beware. Those friendships will change over the years. Not many friendships last genuinely. Okay, genuinely. Unless it's due to very strong common interests and very common characteristics. Okay, but always, always, always understand that true brotherhood for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, filla wa lilla, is not an easy thing. It is deep, it is profound, it requires you to have a strong connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, because that is the thing that is driving your friendship. Your love for Allah is what drives your friendship for the sake of Allah. No one can tell me yeah, that they love someone really for the sake of Allah, but then their heart is empty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have no love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their actions don't show it. If that is the case, this is a false pretense. This is a false sense that they have developed that they say they love someone for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, I, I think I've spoken for, for, for long uh, enough. Um, but one thing I want you to, inshallah, walk away with at least is to think about this topic in more detail. Reflect over yourself, reflect over the friendships that you have in life. See if there's any scope for you to develop those friendships such that it becomes purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hopefully this, inshallah, what you learn today will be a means to you know, improve your companionship and inshallah maybe find someone who, who you can say is your sahib al darb someone who is accompanying you on this journey to the afterlife with the same aim in mind. And if you don't find that, okay, then take guard of yourself, okay, protect yourselves from harmful relationships and from people that will take you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because as the Prophet said, المرء على دين خليله. A person will be on the religion of his friends. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all and grant us sound understanding of the religion, grant us righteous companionship, make us of those who love each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us his nur on the day of judgment and that inshallah we will be from those who will be from al mutahabina fi jalalihi, those who love each other. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma ameen, wa jazakumullah khairan. If, um, if you have any questions, inshallah, you, you can ask. We can use um, the Slido, okay? Um, I don't know if it's been set up for today, actually. Uh, if not, we can just have maybe a roaming mic. If people want to ask, we'll just raise their hands, inshallah. I'll just double check, actually, if the Slido has been... Um, so this is sli.do. Um, you can ask your questions anonymously. Um,
Okay. Um. In the meantime, if they, uh, let me just set this up. If there are any questions, you can ask general questions if you wish as well, inshallah. Yes, so if you love someone because it means that always you need him, uh, speak up of Allah, you know, pray together, mm -hmm. talk other things, maybe. Yeah. yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So when we say that a person, you know, they, they love someone for the sake of Allah, but does that mean that every time they have to um, meet that person, that they have to um, like pray together and, you know, do something righteous together? No, not necessarily. Yeah, I mean that's that would be very hard. I think it's not humanly possible. Yeah, to um, to to always be in a constant state where you're thinking like that. But th that's the point. That the reward, remember, the reward is will always be in accordance with um, how much effort you put in. So if you make that effort to try and make your interactions with that person based upon the deen, then inshallah. The, the greater the reward it will be okay so sometimes for example we can sit together have a coffee talk about football okay you do love that brother for the sake of Allah because of his other qualities but on that occasion okay you're just talking about football you're talking about something else that's fine you're not committing anything haram but will you get reward on that occasion no on that occasion you see him just to have a laugh not necessarily it's not really for the sake of Allah okay but if you make your intention, for example, I want to uh, meet this brother, even if it's for the sake of just having a good time to have some food together. But my intention is to um, protect myself from haram environments. Like if I'm, if I'm not going to spend time with him, I'm going to be spending time with other people that are bad. Okay. So I'm spending time with him, so I know that we're not going to commit anything haram, we're not going to do anything wrong. Then inshallah, there's good intention in that, so you get reward for that. It all goes back to your intention. Yeah? So basically, while we discuss about something, and I advise him for something which is he's doing haram, so that is good intention as well. Yeah, of course. I mean, that you'll get, intention, you'll get reward for... If you see that he's doing something wrong and you're trying to help him, then um, you'll get rewarded for that as well. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Alaikum um, assalam. Say probably you want assistance from Allah and you're doing a, a dua, but you really need help from Allah. What, what can we do to uh, praise Allah to get uh, the dua to the dua? You're asking Allah for something. What's the best cause or way to get a response? Um, sorry, one second, yeah. So, sorry, uh, the, the, the page is open, if you want to ask questions anonymously, it's slido.com or sli.do and the code is um, tafsir, T-A-F-S-I-R. So it's sli.do, slido. This, this is, I'm guessing, specifically for the sisters as well, if they want to ask questions, inshallah. Uh, and then the code is tafsir, T-A-F-S-I-R. Sorry, so, uh, sorry, if you can repeat your question again, sorry. Yeah. if there's many brothers in this situation that they do to Allah, what's yeah. the best dua we can do to get back a response from Allah? Like, you might have victory in something, you're going through a tough time, or there's a trial or something, but you're praising Allah. What's the best way we can sort of get a dua answered? Okay, so the, the question is about the best way to get your dua answered. So, with dua, uh, Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he gave a good analogy once. He, he said, your dua, imagine your dua in the form of an archer. Okay, yeah, so the archer, he needs to have, you know, a very sharp arrow. Okay, the, 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 the bow needs to be strong, 
the elastic on the, it needs to be strong enough. The arm that pulls it needs to be strong. So you have all of these factors to consider. Your dua is like that as well. So your dua has many elements to it. So from amongst that is your sincerity. From amongst that is your presence of mind. Like you often find many people, they'll make dua, but their heart is not present. Yeah, so they'll say like, you know, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wal fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al nar. But they're thinking about what they're going to get for lunch. Yeah. So, you know, their heart and their mind has to be present when they're making dua. Other etiquettes as well that they say, you know, like, um, you know, be in a state of wudu, face the qibla, raise your hands, uh, follow the other etiquette, send salat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in your dua as well. That makes it likely to be answered as well. Praise Allah. Okay, so for example, if you want forgiveness, don't say, oh Allah, forgive me. That's it. Say, ya Rabb, anta al ghafoor al rahim Oh Allah, you are the forgiving, the most merciful. Anta al ghaffar Ya ghaffar so you call upon the names that are suitable for your dua or that relate to your dua. Um, and you incorporate that in your supplications as well. So these are some of the things you can do to strengthen the dua itself. But as long as a person, Umar ibn Khattab used to say, you know, uh, as long as I know I've made the dua, okay, that's all that matters. Meaning, some people, meaning if you've made the dua, that's it. Allah promises he will respond to you. So if you know that you're in a state where you really want to make dua, then inshallah, have certainty that Allah will answer you. You know, so that's the key thing. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, Allaha wa antum bil ijaba." Make dua to Allah whilst being certain that he will answer. If you start doubting and thinking, no, I don't think Allah will answer me. That's going to make your dua very weak. Yeah, so Allah will be as you expect him to be. So if you have certainty that he will answer you, inshallah, he will answer you one way or the other. Inshallah. Okay, sure. Um, I think a question from one of the sisters. Um, I've been desensitized to a sin of my family member and I try my best to forbid the evil and advise, but it's not working. Uh, any advice um, yeah a person can be desensitized to a sin that they might see being committed on a repetitive basis but what you have to remember what you are you know a person cannot be blamed in many ways for developing or becoming somewhat desensitized as long as they are doing their duty so if you for example have advise the person, try to tell them to stop committing a particular sin, you fulfilled your responsibility. Okay, even though your heart might not feel aggravated or enraged when it sees that sin, because you've seen it happen so often. And that's a quality that you find a lot of human beings, they will naturally experience. Okay, but as long as you know you're doing what is within your capability to, you know, forbid that evil, or to try and stop them. And remember, you have to understand that stopping an evil doesn't necessarily mean that you have to literally stop them physically, there and then. Sometimes it's a, it's a long-term process. Okay, it's a long-term process. Like, for example, if someone is addicted to smoking, you can't just stop them like that, right? It's a long-term process. Okay, there was once a time, okay, a brother, he came up to me. He was very scared to come up to me. But he came up to me and he said, you know, I have this problem. He's addicted to smoking, right? He's a, he's a habitual smoker. And so, you know, and, and he knows he wants to stop. It's harming his health. It's not really a good thing to do. So, but then he thought, there's no hope for me. Right? Because, because he goes, I know what you're going to tell me. You can tell me to stop, and I know I can't do it. So I told him, okay, smoke less then. Don't stop, but smoke less. And he's like, what? You're telling me to smoke? I said, look, you're not gonna stop completely, <laughs> all right? So try and gradually, yeah, take it down. Every few days, decrease in that amount until you eventually stop. 
because he's not going to stop in one go, right? So sometimes your solutions need to be you to think about on a long-term basis. You won't be able to stop certain types of sins immediately and in one go. Okay? Wallahu alam. Um, will the class go back to 7.30 next week? It's hard for many brothers to come on time. Due. Yes. So from next week, inshallah, the plan is the lesson will be after Salat al-Isha. Okay. From next week, the class will be after Salat al-Isha because Maghrib is getting too early. Okay. So from next week, inshallah, and I'll make announcement after Salat as well. How is loving for the sake of Allah applicable when you wish to give da'wah to non-Muslims? What are the limits with people who aren't Muslims? Um, uh, I, I believe these are two, these are two separate issues. Okay. Um, these are two separate issues because when you give da'wah to a non-Muslim, it's not really for the sake of, obviously it's for the sake of Allah. But it's not we, we don't say loving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, the Prophet ﷺ would give da'wah to non-Muslims out of hope that they would become believers. He cared for them. Yeah, he cared for them. He didn't want them to go to hellfire. I don't think any believer wants another human being to spend eternity in the hellfire. So that natural, I mean, we don't, that's not necessarily we say that is love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's just a genuine concern. You can have a concern for someone else, but not necessarily it's loving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the act of loving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not something which is, you know, touches upon every act of ibadah that we do. It's a very specific, specific thing. Wallahu a'lam. Is it allowed for non-Muslim to interpret the Quran? Um, I mean, here we have to understand what do you mean by allowed? Okay, because the, the, the non-Muslim doesn't think of halal and haram, does he? He's not going to say, look, I'm a non-Muslim, so it's haram for me to interpret it, so let me stop. He's not going to think like that. Yeah? So the question is, therefore, uh, maybe the, if we were to reword it, and I think maybe this is what the person means, and correct me if I'm wrong, are you allowed to take an interpretation of the Quran from a non-Muslim? If that is the case, then why refer to the interpretation of a non-Muslim when you have the interpretation of a Muslim? Yeah. And knowledge, at the end of the day, is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَنُورُ لَا يُؤْتَى لِعَاصِي And the light of Allah is not given to a sinner. And there's no greater sin than disbelief. So, yeah, so there's no real need to refer to the interpretation of a, a, a non-Muslim. Wa alaikum as -salam. I, I always fear that I am doing something khair for showing off. This is not a bad feeling. It's a good feeling, right? If you're worried that you're doing it, uh, because you're showing off, this will, inshallah, make you want to purify your niyyah. That's why the scholars, they say, Man -ikhlas, fa -ikhlasuhu yahtaju ila -ikhlas. Whoever claims sincerity, then his sincerity requires sincerity. Because ikhlas actually means to purify. So whoever claims sincerity, then he, he needs to purify his intention even more. No one truly knows if they're sincere or not. But you should always accuse your niyyah and question yourself, am I really doing it for the sake of Allah? That's a healthy state to be in. Wallahu alam. <coughs> Can a sahib be from your family, your brother or sister? Yeah, if you mean someone you love for the sake of Allah, of course, it can be anyone. It can be, you know, your spouse, Right, and that's why, Iman, in fact, uh, Imam al-Ghazali mentions the example of a spouse that you can love for their that, meaning due to their, for example, physical appearance, love for, uh, you know, for who they are and their good qualities. But you can also love your spouse, fillah and lillah. How? Because you see, for example, your spouse is a means by which you earn reward. 
If you feed your family, this is a means of attaining paradise. If you take care of them, this is a means of, again, earning ajr from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and becoming beloved to Allah. So you love your spouse because you see your spouse as a means of attaining goodness. Your spouse protects you from haram, from falling into zina. So you love your spouse for that reason. So it becomes filla, hub filla. Okay, and if you have a very righteous spouse, then you love them lilla. Because you see that your spouse is someone who is beloved to Allah, and so you love them out of your love for Allah. Out of your love for Allah. So even your spouse, you can love filla and lilla. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Uh, some sisters live far away and it's not safe to have a late class. Perhaps we could uh, come to a compromise at 7 p.m. Um, that is a possibility. Okay, that is a possibility. The, the benefit though of, of associating the class with a prayer time is that you tend to get more people. Because they'll come for salah and then they'll just stay basically, carrying on. But um, <coughs> Salat al-Isha I think next week will be... 7.45, I think. Salat al-Isha, yeah? 7.45. Okay, and in the winter, I'm not sure what the plan is when the clocks go back. When the clocks go back, I think Salat al-Isha will be at 7 anyway. I'm not sure. It comes to 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, okay, all right. So, we'll see, inshallah. When the clocks go back, we'll see what happens. And then, you know, we'll do the class after, after that. But from next week, for, for at least for the last couple of weeks in October, the class will be after Salat al-Isha, inshallah. Um, okay, we're taking a couple more questions from, from, from the floor here. If not, then we can just stop there, inshallah. Yes. Yeah. What else can like, husbands and wives do in the family? What actions are really good? Like, we get a lot of couples that go through marriage, you go through difficulties. What could they concentrate on which will please Allah and bring blessings towards them? Yeah. So... Families that are going through difficulties, um, I mean, relationships are very complex things. things. And um, there are many dynamics to that. Sometimes, you know, um, you know the, 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 there is a, a common belief that, you know, the, the closer you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the closer you'll be to, uh, to one another, okay? There's this interesting, um, uh, like a pyramid, Right or triangle, where you have the husband and the and the wife at the bottom and Allah at the top, meaning the closer you get to Allah, the closer you end up being to one another. Right, that is true, I think, to a certain degree. Okay, I think people have simplified it maybe a bit too much. Okay, because relationships aren't just based upon your 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 status with Allah. Let's be frank, because you can have two people who are from awliya of Allah, okay, but they can't get along with one another. And that's common, that happens, that can happen. Okay, many of the Sahabiyat, right, they would complain about their husbands. They were very righteous men, very righteous men, but they just, they, they didn't get along. Okay, so it's not just about being righteous. Okay, human relationships are based upon other factors as well. You know, practicalities, you know, common interests and things like that. And so those things have to be looked into as well. We can't just say, well, just pray and everything will be better. Um, look at the dynamics of your relationship, see if there are, there are things that you can compromise on, things you can do that can, uh, uh, you know, um, help the relationship, whether it be by compromising or doing certain things or not doing certain things. So you have to look into that as well. Wallahu a'lam. Okay, inshallah, we'll stop there for today. Inshallah, jazakum khairan. Subhanakallah, bihamdika, shadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa tawbilik. Assalamu alaikum wa tawbilik.